Yeah, I'll hear the name. Just a quick moment. It, thanks for joining everyone. So I'm so excited to be seeing you all today. And we are here with the next session in our deep dive. This is the fifth session in our deep dive series. So today we have our wonderful Michelle uh, to go over the data unification in the data cloud. So we have a couple of other sessions lined up. So these are all published on the user group. You see this Salesforce Marketing Cloud uh, Phoenix user group. This is the user group. So if you have already joined this group, you would automatically get notifications of all the published events. So these are the upcoming series, uh, upcoming sessions in this series. For the deep dive with uh, Michelle, we are having this session today. And the next Tuesday, Tim is going to go uh, over the data actions. And then we have uh, a couple of uh, few uh, hands-on sessions also lined up. We, last Thursday, we had the first hands-on session with Sarandesh. And this Thursday, we have uh, the data ingestion and integration. I think Sandesh is going to go over that. And similarly, every Thursday, we have these hands-on sessions happening at, at the same time, 8 a.m. Um, and this is on June 6th, and then June 13th, the fifth hands-on session. And there are more also. And as per the deep dive sessions, they're happening every Tuesday. So the next deep dive is on 28th by Tim. And the other one is on June 4th, that is the third Tuesday. This is by uh, Jacob and then June 11th, the next deep dive is by, is by Funny. It's about the implementation best practices, requirements and planning. Um, so this is the schedule as of now. Every Tuesday we have the deep dive sessions. And every Thursday, we have the hands-on sessions. And my special thanks to Tim, Tim and team, Tim, Sandesh, Michelle, uh, for coming up with these hands-on sessions and then uh, planning for these and then collaborating on these ones. So make sure that you have registered to these sessions if you're interested to join these ones. So select the topic and make sure that you register to these ones. And most importantly, make sure that you are following the LinkedIn handles of uh, uh, mine and Tim to get all the important updates. If you're not already on the Slack channel, LinkedIn is the best way to get all the updates. So there may be some updates with respect to this user group. So I'm not sure yet, but there may be some updates. So that's the reason I request everybody to follow on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn will be the best place to get notified on, if not this user group, LinkedIn will be the best place to get notified. And uh, once again, I thank everyone for joining these sessions. And without you, these uh, boot camps wouldn't happen. These sessions wouldn't happen. And along with the speakers, I would thank everyone who are involved in this, in making this boot camp series possible. So with that, I won't take much time. Uh, that is all from my end, Michelle. Please go ahead and share Great. the screen. Thanks, JB. Let me start sharing. Awesome. All right. Can everyone see the deck? Streamlining data unification with data cloud. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So let's get started. So just a quick introduction. I'm Michelle Medina. Um, I'm a senior Salesforce consultant at Cervelo. I've participated in a few of these bootcamp sessions. So um, AmpScript, SSJS, Marketing Cloud Personalization. So I'm excited and looking forward to discussing data cloud and specifically data unification and mapping with you all. So thank you all for joining. Um, we'll do a quick overview of what we'll walk through today. So just gonna highlight some of the key concepts that we'll be walking through specifically within the data cloud platform. Um, I don't wanna spend too much time. I wanna spend most of my time within the data cloud. Uh, there's was uh, the previous data cloud bootcamp sessions covered these topics in great detail. So I do definitely recommend um, going through those YouTube uh, sessions. Um, they're on the YouTube playlist. So 
again, recommend going that, but we'll go over a quick overview for any refreshers, and then we'll jump right into the use case um, and right into the platform. So we'll do data mapping, the identity resolution configuration. Um, we'll look at those unified profiles, and then we'll uh, start, we'll build those segments. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions. All right, let's get started. So before we jump in, um, just a quick reminder that last week, my colleague Sandesh uh, walked us through the ingestion piece. Um, I do recommend, so this that would be the first step to this process. So I do recommend if you haven't watched already, um, recommend watching that. And then this would be, you know, the second step in terms, in terms of data mapping, uh, the data unification and the segmentation piece. Um, so like I said, I won't go into too much detail about these concepts, but I wanted to just give a, highlight those key, key topics here. So for any implementation and for our, our UK use case that we'll be going through, there are a few data model objects that we need to be familiar with. Um, so these objects are important for the unification configuring that identity resolution. Um, so you'll see here in the middle that individual object along with some of those uh, attribute objects like the contact point address, contact point phone, email, app, uh, social. Um, so the, the individual object represents a person really. So if you wanna collect the person's attributes and use them to unify and recognize multiple profiles and link those profiles together, you'll want to map to this individual uh, data model object. So these normally, these attributes that they're normally represent attributes like uh, first name, last name, you'll need some sort of unique identifier for the individual. Um, so the fields that you see in this diagram are the minimum fields, required fields that have to be mapped in order to use them in identity resolution. So then if we look to, you know, around the individual object here, you'll see other commonly used data model objects like the contact point email, so you, which you'll need, you know, an email address to map to and again, um, a unique identifier. So if you're looking to use email address to configure identity resident, again, you'll have to map to that contact point email. And if you want to use, you know, phone numbers or an address to configure that identity resolution and link those profiles together, you'll have to map to those contact point DMOs. So you have the contact point address for mapping to addresses and contact point phones for uh, phone numbers. So on the left-hand side of this diagram, you see the party identification object. Um, it's an object that allows us to use external identifiers that, that has been used to identify people in, in different systems. So a common example of this is uh, a driver license or uh, a loyalty member ID. So let me here. So uh, some of those key data mapping concepts within the design and then the build phases are first one will be that data inventory, right? So we want to make sure to audit all of your data, your sources. Um, it's critical to understand the data relationships, you know, key identifiers, any data overlap, data governance, et cetera. It's, it's very important. And I will emphasize this emphasize this more than once throughout this uh, session to understand your data before any ingestion and in, in building in data cloud. So I would definitely recommend taking your time within the des this design phase. Um, so the second step or this, the second concept here is um, understanding also that field level data. So making sure, you know, is that data accurate? Determine what objects and fields will be mapped and, you know, what will it map to? What DMO will it map to? What fields in that DMO will it map to? Um, again, take your time during this design phase. And then um, also within this, you know, this field level data inspection, consider the primary keys, you know, also think about if your data is normalized or denormalized, or if there's any data transformation that needs to happen um, once you ingest into uh, data cloud. So again, think about, you know, what the mapping will look like and take your time within that design phase. And then once you've planned and designed that your data model and what that would look like, you can then start configuring the mapping. Um, so make sure again, to have that good understanding of all your data sources and your fields and values before you actually start mapping to the DMOs. Um, because making changes after mapping will be much harder and more complex to then configuring it 
correctly and the initial implementation. So again, it, you might think it's easy to unmap a few fields and you know start all over once it's already been configured. It's actually a lot more complex and there's a lot of uh, downstream impacts that in relationships that will have to be also deconfigured to uh, you know uh, fix any mistakes that you might have made through the first initial build phase. So then once you have that configuration complete, you can now also configure the relationship. So uh, once you map the DMOs, there are some default relationships that are made. So you can make updates to those, you know, make sure those are accurate and add any new relationships that you're um, looking to add for your data model. So just a quick identity resolution overview. Um, for today, we'll just walk through some of those key concepts and terminology. Uh, it, identity resolution really is a twofold process. So, you know, the first step is to run those matching roles. And it, it looks across all the different attributes and contact points and identifiers for individuals. And that's what will create this unified profile. So from there, it'll run through the reconciliation rules that we configure. So you define those attributes that will represent the unified profile. So the image here on this slide gives you a more of a, that visual representation of identity resolution. So it's gonna produce that unified profile and a unified link. So a unified profile is really that single view of the customer. Um, so it it's the record that links all the profiles together. So uh, when you're looking for that single view of all the profiles matched into one, that's what you're, you're, you're gonna be looking at that unified profile. And the unified link is essentially it's a, it's a junction between the unified profile and the connected profile. Um, so again, I, I do wanna emphasize the importance of understanding your data. So it's, it's critical in the general implementation of data cloud, but also specifically for the identity resolution configuration. So it's definitely under, make sure to understand the attributes that can be used to identify customers, any new, unique IDs, all the field values and fields coming in. All right. So uh, now let's jump to the segmentation piece. So segments, um, after you configure and you validate that your identity resolution rule set is you know, working as expected, you can jump into the segments configuration. So segments are used to understand and target and analyze a subset of customers. Um, again, that's user defined based on the criteria that you set. And then you can build you know, simple rules, which would be segments, or you can get a a little bit more complex into calculated insights. So uh, for our use case, use case, which I'll explain the use case shortly, um, we'll build segments for specific groups of audiences that we want to target. All right, so the use case. Uh, so again, uh, my colleague Sandesh last week introduced us to the use case and the ingestion piece of it. So I'll just give you a quick recap of what that use case is. So we have a financial institution that's facing challenges with integrating three separate data sources. So it's hindering their ability to gain that 360 view of their customers. Uh, so they wanna use data, data cloud to address this problem so we can link the enterprise data the mobile application data and also our, the Salesforce CRM data. So then it'll give them that single view of their customers that they've been looking for. Uh, I'm introducing two slides from my colleague Sandesh just to again, give that quick refresher of what this, uh, the ingestion data sources are. So that enterprise data that I mentioned is you know hosted in Amazon S3 and it includes more of that uh, customer demographic data, like first name, last name, address, phone number, account number. Um, so then this financial services client also has a mobile app that allows customer to open a bank account, uh, link their bank account, make a deposit into their account, and, um, and also the Salesforce CRM and marketing cloud data or databases will have more of that contact and subscriber information that they also wanna use to link. Um, and then our next slide here, so just going a little deeper into that mobile app ingestion. So the mobile app has is tracking activities, um, specifically the, the progress that the user is making during their uh, journey and their onboarding journey. So the app use, so the specific steps are, you know, that user signs up for the app, they agree to open an account, and there's a few different types of accounts. 
uh, they can then bank link and then they can deposit money into that bank link. Um, so all of the user actions that we are tracking in the mobile app are engagement events, except the initial signup. So now, I, before we jump into data cloud, I did just want to give a quick overview of what we'll be covering and what, you know, really what that the whole end-to-end -end sequence looks like. So again, on your left, you'll see your data sources. So you have your enterprise system, your mobile app, your Salesforce CRM, and your marketing cloud. Um, I did simplify this uh, so you know you could have a variety of, or multiple data streams for each uh, data source, but just to keep it simple, I, I just represented it with one. Um, but then you have your data streams that are highlighted in the first purple box. So once you ingest uh, your data sources, it'll create those data streams that will be moving into a data lake object. And then once you configure the data mapping, those will be mapped to standard data cloud models, uh, data model objects, and or custom data model objects that you can create. And then you'll have the unification piece, which is the identity resolution configuration. And then you'll end, after that is complete, that's when you'll go into your segmentation. So creating those segments, those set of audiences that you want to target or um, analyze or, you know, further get a further understanding of what this audience is doing and what they look like and their actions. Um, and specifically within this use case, you know, what, you know, how can we make them move down the pipeline and within the app, you know, link their bank accounts, deposit that money, um, open an account for those who haven't opened an account yet. So um, let's jump into data cloud. Now we should have time for questions at the end. Uh, so thank you for bringing those up if there are any questions so far. Let me... The, the zoom bar is in the way and I can get it out. <laughs> Okay, so can everyone see the data cloud platform? I can take silence as a yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so first we'll start with the data streams. Again, um, this is the second part of second, essentially the second step of this process. So Sandesh and last week's session on Tuesday, last week, last Tuesday session, he went through the ingestion piece and how these data streams are initially created. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but I did want to call these out and also we'll, we'll go into more of the mapping. Um, so our, our primary focus for this session will be configuring the mapping. Um, so it's, and I'll emphasize this again, important to understand that your data model, the data coming in, the values, the field, your unique identifiers, um, before any ingestion and mapping occurs. So let's jump into the first DMO. Um, we can start, right, we just created a view here to make this easier for us. Uh, we can start with our enterprise data. So again, this is coming from um, an S3 bucket in Amazon. So if we open our enterprise data, you'll see here, um, this is a, a profile object category and you'll see the fields that we're mapping underneath uh, the fields that are coming in from the enterprise data. So wanted to call out a few of these fields as they'll be important for us during mapping. Um, so you'll see here that we have a formula field called the enterprise account key. And this is our primary key. So what the, the way we ingested this and we had to create a formula field for this, we're concatenating you know, our enterprise link to identify where this data or this unique identifier is coming from. And then we're using um, the account number field that's also coming in from the enterprise data. So again, we want to make sure that the primary key should be unique to the user and unique to the source. So um, that's why we had to create this uh, formula field. Because um, otherwise, you know, what, what would be our unique identifier would be this account number, but this account number could live in other data sources. Um, 
So also wanted to ca call out the party identification name field here. So this is our party identification type. So this is also a formula field that we created. Um, and it's really just displaying this text account identifier. So why we were doing this is we wanted we want to map, and I'll walk through this, the party identification object. Uh, so we needed some of these fields that aren't coming directly from that enterprise data. So we had to transform our, transform our data or create these formula fields to make sure uh, that we're, we have all the necessary fields and values to map correctly to the party identification object. So similarly with this identification name field here, um, again, you'll see it's just displaying a text. So we're just identifying the identification type and then also the enterprise account number, which is the, our identification name. And again, we'll walk through the mapping shortly. Um, so let's jump into what the field mapping would look like here. So these are mapped, but I'll walk through you know, each mapping here. Um, we have to map it just for this, this use case or this session. Um, but again, so on our left, you'll see the bootcamp enterprise data. So that's our data source. Then you'll see all of the fields um, from that data source. And on your right is where you'll see all of the smart, or data cloud data model objects. So these are your standards. And this is also where you get able to create those custom objects. So, you know, initially you'll have this data stream and, you know, really none of the fields are mapped. Some of those uh Standard fields may be mapped to standard objects, but this is where your design phase really comes into play. So you, you know, you've identified the model, the objects that you want to map to, um, and what fields you will be mapping to what field on the data model object. So also to think about this, you, you, what, you know, the question that might come up is, you know, how do you, how do I know what I need to map to? So think about how, what you are going to use for the identity resolution configuration. So what attributes from a customer across multiple sources will have that unification or what will we need to make that unification? So you'll see from our enterprise data, we have some of the demographic data like uh, addresses here. So you'll see we have a street field, we have state, zip code, um, city, and country. So We'll, we'll know if we want to use this for identity resolution, which we will, we we'll want to map to the contact point address object. So um, just if people aren't aware, you can in this but, uh, pencil icon here, this is where your objects live. So you can search for each object that you'd like to add and map to. So if I were to just search contact, you know, you'll see and you can click check and it'll bring those um, data model objects into your, your mapping view here. So what we've done here is, you know, we'll, we've identified some fields that we need to map. So if you can look at on the left-hand side, you'll see street is mapped to address line one. And city is mapped to city. Our contact point address ID is mapped to the, which is a primary key, is mapped to our primary key, which is that enterprise account key formula field that we created. Um, country is mapped to country. and so, uh, Postal codes map to postal code and state province is mapped to state. I find so Salesforce has great documentation on each of these data model objects, which outlines the object and also all of the fields, which I think is extremely helpful, um, especially if you're not familiar with the object. It'll give you an explanation of what that field is and it'll give you a better understanding of what fields you should be mapping to. Um, so you'll see we've mapped, you know, it's it's straightforward in terms of an address you'll see this party field. And if you remember from that diagram, you'll see that every of those attribute objects have that party field. So a party field is really, again, it represents the individual. So in our case, what's the ID that's representing the individual, again, is still that enterprise account key field that we, we have, um, which again is a formula field that is from, you know, concaten concatenating the enterprise lake text with the, the account number. Um, so again, this field is important to map from each of these objects again, because it's representing, it's going back to that individual. Um, so we have the address field maps or the fields are maps. So now we can look, you know, what else, what type of other data do we have and what else are we gonna be using for the identity resolution configuration? So we have email. 
Um, so again, there's a contact point email object. Um, and we'll be able to map those fields similarly as we did for the point address. So you'll see here, um, our primary key for the contact point email is mapped to our primary key, the enterprise account key. And similarly, similarly email address is mapped to email address and party is mapped to uh, the enterprise account key. So um, just for reference here, if you needed to map any more fields that you, you may be having that are coming in from your data sources, you're, you can do that as well. Um, so then again, similarly, I won't walk through all of these, uh, the contact point object as they are similar. So you'll see here, we're mapping again, the same uh, fields accordingly to the uh, objects and party is still mapped to uh, the enterprise account key. And then if we jump to the individual object on our right here, this is right the, the, the object that represents that individual. You can see actually here that this is a custom field that we created. So in our uh, enterprise data, you'll see we have an account created field. Standard object in the, the standard individual uh, data model object does not have that field. Or, you know, you run into those use cases where you have these unique fields that, or these custom fields that you know, isn't in part of the standard. So you are able to create those custom fields. Um, so if you were to click on this unmap button, this drop down here, you'd be able to add a new field. Um, so then you can name it, choose your data type, um, and you can enable this value suggestion if, if needed, if necessary. And then you'd have these custom fields. So again, so once we created that custom field, we're able to map our account, the enterprise account created date field to the, our new custom account created date field. And similarly with account number, we map the account number that's coming from the enterprise data to the account number. Um, we map their first name, last name, and again, that individual ID is that primary key, and we're mapping it to our primary key. Uh, all right, so again, you still have that option to uh, map any other fields that you'd want it to pull in uh, as well. And then last but not least is the party identification object. Again, this is an optional object. You don't necessarily are required to map it, um, but again, this is this is an object that helps identify, that uses an external identifier to identify um, a person or an individual. So you'll see these are the minimum required fields to map for, to be able to use the party identification object in your identity resolution rule set. So if we just look here quickly, we have the identification name, standard, you know, the standard field in the party identification object. But if you remember, hey, before we jump into the mapping, we created two of those formula fields, um, right? Because we didn't have that data initially coming in from our enterprise data uh, source. So you'll see here that we're mapping our new, our custom formula field to the identification uh, name standard field. Um, Similarly, party is mapped to the prime to our primary key again because that's representing the individual. Um, our part, the party identification ID, which is the party identification primary key, is mapped again to our primary key. It's it, representing the individual. It's also the primary unique identifier for this object. And then, similarly, the party identification type. We are mapping our custom, our that formula field that we created to uh, this standard party identification type field. And last but not least, the party, again, it's representing that individual. So be able to match all of these profiles together. We have to make sure that, you know, the primary keys are correctly mapped and also these party fields are co correctly mapped in each object. As again, if the IDs aren't gonna match, they, DataCog won't be able to unify those profiles, right? Because the IDs are different. Um, so this is where you'll see uh, that party field represents that individual. So it's mapped to our, our, our enterprise account key. You, based on your data sources, you're definitely able to map more of those uh, objects. For this use case, really, we're looking at the address, the email, our phone, you know, obviously, you know, really the individual and also our party identification objects. So once you've mapped all of those fields, you can save and close. And we'll walk through another um, data stream. So we did the enterprise data. We'll walk through a couple of the mobile app data streams coming in. And then we'll do a the contact object just to see what a Salesforce CRM 
mapping would be. But again, they are similar in terms of, you know, how you map the fields. You just have to really consider, you know, what objects you're mapping to, the fields, any unique IDs or primary keys as well. So if we go back to the data streams tab here. Let's jump into what um, one of the mobile app uh, data streams would look like and what that mapping would look like. So let's start with uh, the user sign up. Um, so again, all of the uh, events that are coming from the mobile app are engagement events, except this user sign up. So this is the another profile object category. Um, so I wanted to just cure fields. So I wanted to just call out a few of those fields. So you'll see we have some of that demographic data as well. We have email, first name, you know, our phone, state, or we have our address. Um, we have a user ID specifically tied to that user in the app. Um, we also have more of the overview, high-level banking details. So we have if they've agreed to open an account, if they've bank link, if they've deposited cash, um, the date that this, you know, the it, the record was created. But in our sense, we're using this as you know the date that they opened, uh, they signed up, um, and also an account type. So as I mentioned, there's different account types. So we they have the ability to open a brokerage account, a crypto account, a high yield savings account. Uh, so we, we want to be able to track that. So we have these fields coming in, and again to highlight. So we have a what our primary key is what we've labeled here, our composite key. So if we were to edit this formula, it's similar formula of, of the enterprise primary key. So, right, we're concatenating, right, what we, where this data come from. So, you know, you can really, you know, make this text, whatever uh, is see, fits your data model and your org. But for this use case, we're, you know, saying this is a mobile app, and then we have that a user ID. So again, that's that uh, ID for that user in the app. So we're, uh, concatenating those together as our primary key. And then we also have those same fields, again, knowing that we want to map to the party identification object. We don't have those fields necessarily. We have the party identification type and also the identification name uh, right here. So now we can walk through what the mapping would look like. And again, I mentioned it is very similar to um, what the enterprise data uh, would be mapped to, but just wanted to quickly go through it. Um, so again, you'll see your data stream on your left and then your data model objects on your right. Um, so you'll see all of our fields here, our account type, our balance, um, primary keys, all of that information that we just went through. So again, we are mapping um, our address attributes to the contact point address. You'll see again, our party is mapped to that composite key. The primary key is mapped to our primary key as well. Um, similarly with email, you'll see the same. So you'll see our composite key is mapped to the party for that individual. Um, and then also our primary key and the email address are also mapped. And the phone as well. So you'll see party mapped to that, that comp the composite key, similarly with our primary key and then also um, our phone, excuse me, the phone is mapped to our phone number, the phone, phone number field here. So now it's with the individual object, again, you'll see that we've mapped some of those standard fields, our first name, last name. Then we have more custom fields, right? So the individual object didn't have these fields that we needed, so that we wanted to map. So again, we created those custom uh, fields through uh, the add a new attribute section right here. So again, you're able to choose your uh, data type um, and label your field as accordingly. So we map those custom fields as well, right? So, you know, have they deposit, so our have deposited cash field is mapped to if they've funded their account, right? So you can name these fields as you see fit, um, account terms agreement, um, the account type, um, if they've bank linked. So we've mapped our data stream fields to these custom fields. And to just quickly go through the party identification object, um, similarly, we map those fields and you'll see here, the party is mapped to that composite. So I wanna go through, I, I won't, just in the interest of time, we won't be able to get through all of the mappings. Um, so I did wanna just walk through what an engagement uh, category mapping would look like. It's 
a bit different than you know what we've just seen with the user sign up in the uh, enterprise data. So if we go back just to our boot camps, um, we do account creation here. So we have, again, this is an engagement event. Um, so you'll see uh, this data is being passed once they create their account. Um, so you'll see similarly here, um, we have uh, this individual ID. Uh, so this individual ID field was created um, in the same concept that we need to make sure that this ID matches or uh, yeah, matches the back to an individual, right? So if we were to just use, um, let's, let me back track a little bit. So here's our field. Um, so we have that user ID, which is that what um, identifies the user in the app. We have the transaction ID, which is our primary key. So it's more of the engagement event ID. Um, we have the created date time field. So that's uh, you know when this account was created. Um, so then just uh, keep this individual ID field in mind. So once we go into the map in here, <clears throat> you'll see we have our data stream on the left and our object on the right. So again, this is an engagement event. So you're not, you won't be seeing the individual object, the contact point objects, um, the party identification objects, because we're not, this is not a, you know, a profile object. This is more of an engagement. So how would we map this back to that individual who created, uh, who had this event, who had this engagement with the app, um, based off of what we just mapped for our profile objects, right? So for our enterprise data and for our mobile app user sign up data stream, <clears throat> we had the, that individual ID or that primary key that was mapping to the party field. So how do we make sure this is pieced together and uh, data cloud unifies these profiles and unifies this engagement back to those individuals? So we have, there's a device application engagement uh, standard data model object. Um, which is, again, Salesforce has extensive documentation on each of these objects and fields. Um, so this is more of a, uh, you can use this object for, you know, a device engagement stream. So again, we created, uh, just looking at the field mappings, we created a custom field for account type. Uh, we created, uh, the created date is uh, mapped to our created date. Our, the device application engagement um, ID, which is the primary key, is mapped to our primary key, which is that transaction ID. So when this action took place, or that ID for when that action took place, um, the individual is needs to be mapped again to uh, our individual ID. So we could if initially you could think, oh, we could use you know the, our user ID, but if you think back to those data streams that we mapped, the profile ones. We weren't using just the user ID. We had that concatenation to identify what that ID, where it was coming from. So that's why we created the same formula field for this data stream to be able to map it back to the individual. So then when we see that unified profile, you'll see the engagements um, also getting tied in. Similarly, we created, uh, we have our engagement name to a name, the engagement name field here, and then user email is mapped to that user email. Um, again, there's multiple other fields you can use if you wanted to, if you needed to map to another engagement object, you can do so as well. So let me close out of this. In the interest of time, um, I will go quickly over the contact object just to see what a Salesforce CRM mapping would look like. But again, it's very similar as its profile object. Um, but I just wanted to show you that quickly and then we can jump into the uh, identity resolution piece. So if we open, so once you create those data streams, you'll have these contact objects uh, or the objects that you wanted to ingest, they'll come in as these objects. And what it really is doing here is giving you the, the object name and the Salesforce org ID that it's coming from. We click into the contact. Um, you'll see we're pulling in a variety of those contact fields. Um, you'll also see here that we have created some of those similar formula fields for our party identification object. So you'll see um, our identification name, so this is a CRM ID, and then also our party identification type, which is, you know, it, what, type, what is this? This is a person identifier. So we have that here. And then also 
Uh, let's just jump into the mappings really quickly. So again, you'll see that we have our fields on the left and then also our contact point address fields, our point emails. Um, you'll see that the party fields for these uh, data model objects are getting mapped to our contact ID, which is that unique Salesforce contact ID. Again, that's representing that individual. So you'll see here, similarly, you have that contact ID mapped to the party field. Our individuals, we're mapping all of those fields as well. The individual ID here is mapped to that contact ID field um, and the party identification objects, similarly, um, our contact ID is mapped to the party field and then the primary keys are also mapped to each other. So let's jump into the identity resolution configuration um, just in the interest of time. So let's look all right. So once you have all your mappings configured, um, you can even look quickly through Data Explorer to see what that the data streams uh, data looks like coming in. So then if you jump into the identity resolution tab, you'll have uh, your where you can create a new identity resolution rule set uh, for this use case. So you choose your data space. We only have this default data space, but you may have, be able to have those different data spaces. And then you have to choose the primary data model object. For our use case, we are representing the individual. So we are looking at a uh, customer. There is those B2B. So you know, if you are, we're mapping on an account, this would look a bit different, but we are using the individual object. So we would uh, start our rule set with the individual data model object. So if I just click cancel since we have already created one. Um, you look here, so you'll have on the left-hand side, you'd have your match rules, which we'll walk through. And then you're right below that, you have your reconciliation rules. So then also you have those uh, individual and the individual attributes that you know, you'd know you be able to choose those specific rules on the best value to save for that unified profile. So you know what is the ultimate value that we're gonna be using to represent that unified profile. And then on the right here, you'll see, um, more of the summary. So, you know, our, all of the unified profiles out of the source profiles, our consolidation rate, the known unified profile. And then this warnings tabs, you'll see, just gives you a warning um, for this use case. We're, we're not really using these objects, but again, if you're using, it, it'll warn you for any objects that are maybe missing some of those requir required fields for mapping. You'll see that here as well. And then in the details tab, you'll see more of the, uh, summary resolution numbers and the, more of the identity resolution properties. And then you'll see in your processing tabs, the last time it was processed, um, your source, again, more of those numbers or those details of, around the resolution in, in itself. All right, so if we were to jump into the match rules here, so if you click edit, you know, it'll give you more of the instructions on how to create a match rule. Click next. So You'll have um, all your match rules that are have been configured will be will be here. Um, so then you can add a new one, a, a new match rule here, uh, and it, it does give you some of those standard match rules, or you can create a custom rule where you start from scratch. Um, so you'd be able to name your custom rule at the bottom here, and then also select your object that you want to uh, match against. So. Um, if we just go back to some of the rule sets we created. So we go here. Again, I started these with custom rule set or off of one of those standard ones. So you can see here, we're matching against the individual. We want to match against the individual object for our use case, right? So we want to be able to match these profiles on first name, last name, the same address, and the same um, that could be one rule set. We have this rule set that's matching the first name, last name. Um, email address and account number. So that's what we're doing here, right? So we we click the individual object. We chose the field that we wanted to match off of, which is a first name. We chose a match method, which is a we decided to go with a fuzzy high precision. But you have all of these options if you wanted to match exactly or do more of a low precision precision with you know the fuzziness here, low or medium precision or exact normalized. Um, for the individual, again, we want to also map the last name, so we'd have to choose our object again choose the field, uh, the last name. And again, we wanted to match on the exact. We also wanted to include, so for this rule set, like I mentioned, we want to include matching on first name, last name. 
the email address and account number. So that's one of our rule sets. So here's what, that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing where you're pulling in the email address and then we'll, and then lastly, we have the individual object and that's the account number that field that we map to. Um, and we want that to match exactly. So then you can name your match rule, whatever you want. If you click next, you'll see again, all of the, you go back to the match rules. If we wanted to just show another match rule here. So the second match rule is we wanted to match to match profiles that are your first name, last name, have an exact address and also the exact account number. Um, so this is what you're going to see here. And again, it's similar. So you'd have to choose for every attribute and, or field that you'd want to match against. You choose the object that it's coming from, the first name, and then your match method. Similarly, with the contact point address field, we want to match on the address, the street address, exact normalized, um, the city as well. Um, it's a little... Uh, not ordered correctly, but then if we just, just jump to here, again, you'll see that we want to match the state and also the country. And then we also wanted to include the account number. So we have the individual object, uh, the account number, and we want that to match exactly. So we have that next. And then I'll just show you what the, we have a other few rules here. Um, so you have that fuzzy name. Uh, we also wanted to match on the name, the normalized address, and also the phone number. So again, you can configure these rule sets to, uh, you know, what fits your data model correctly. And then once you have a better understanding of, you know, the data that you, your data sources and the data that's coming in, you'll be able to configure these rules and think about how do we want to match these unified profiles. So if you think about it, the more criteria you add to one of these match rules, you know, uh, it'll it'll be harder to get these unified profiles together. Um, the more match rules you have in general, there's a higher chance to match or unify those profiles. Um, so keep that in mind as you're creating these match rules. Again, so more criteria will make it more difficult or maybe a smaller percentage of those unified profiles. More match rules gives you a higher chance of getting a, a unified profile. Um, and once you have, a, a like I mentioned, a better understanding of your data model, the data coming in, uh, those fields coming in, you know how those values are coming in, you'd be able to configure these match rules. We look at this third match rule. Um, so we just look at what a party identification match rule would look like. You'll see here, um, we chose the party identification object. We wanted to match on uh, the identification number exactly. So this is where you would output or type in what the party identification type. So this is where you have to make sure this matches correctly to your data streams and what those values are mapped to. Um, because this is what it's going to look like to be able to match, to be able to unify those profiles. This is, they're going to, Data Cloud is looking at this criteria specifically um, to see where you can match those. Then the individual, again, we're using the first name, last name, and then also for this rule set, we're including the email. Click back. All right. So we have, when once those match rules are set, we can jump into the reconciliation rules, right? So the reconciliation rules are really, so you're you're choosing the value that's gonna represent the unified profile. So what value, you know, if there's multiple first names or multiple account, different account numbers, you know, maybe with a manual in, import of data into your Salesforce CRM, there's there could have been a mistake. So what is your source of truth in that sense where you want, you know, the, account number that's coming from the enterprise data to always, you know, be that account number, represent that unified profile. So this is where you rec you create those reconciliation rules. Um, so to quickly go through them, the most free, so there's a few default rules and then you can quickly, um, or you can go through each, uh, if you wanted a uh, field within this object to have, you know, different rule, um, you don't have to use the default rule, but you can if you wanted to. So this default rule is set to most frequent. The most frequent, which essentially means the most frequent occurring value will be selected for the unified profile. We just jump into individual. Um, similarly, you know, we've had this for contact point email and contact point phone. So you can configure this at a default level and then also um, go a little deeper into field level. Um, configuration. So for our default rec reconciliation rule here, we have the source priority. This priority here is 
It sorts out your data lake objects in the order that you most prefer to the least preferred, again, for that unified enterprise or the unified profile. So you'll see here, we've ordered all of our data streams, right? So we are taking in priority that enterprise data. And then um, it, it'll go down to our least preferred. So our second most preferred data source would be that mobile app user sign up and then our contact data and so forth. So that's our default reconciliation rule. But if you can see um, here, so you'll see enterprise data, this, uh, this uh, order, enterprise data, uh, user sign up, and then contact objects. So if we were to just look at account number, check that box, um, you'll see, actually this isn't, but let's go here. So our bank name, you can, check multiple boxes uh, to update those um, multiple fields at the uh, same time. So you'll see here, we still have source priority, but for bank name, we actually want to prioritize the bank name that's coming from the user sign up uh, mobile app stream um, or the mobile app. So again, we're looking at, we have a different priority for this field. Um, and again, you can configure this as needed to your data model and you know your data sources. So. We have those reconciliation rules configured. Um, the identity resolution rule set, you do you can run it manually. You could also set a trigger to run it. For both options, you, it could only run four times within 24 hours. It does, you see in this processing history tab, you see that this automatic runs is enabled. It does automatically run once per day, but you can run it uh, four times within 24 hours. So now that we have created this, our identity resolution rule set, I just want to quickly show you what a profile would look like. So in Profile Explorer, you can choose your data space, you can choose the object, and you can choose the attribute that you want to search against. So I am going to do email. I have a bunch of test records for my email, so I know I think a lot will come up, but I will show you the one that uh, I've created specifically for this use case. We look for our email here. Um, like I said, I have a bunch of test records, so there's a bunch that I created, but this first one is what the one we're looking for that, you know, I have a test record in the enterprise data. I also have a CRM record and I also have a mobile app record. So here's your unified profile. So your first name, last name, and again, can edit the details that you see on this page through the Lightning Page Explorer editor. Um, so, We've also have our investment attributes right here. Um, and if you look further down, there's the individual related uh, records. So this is showing you all of the individual records that were unified and matched together for this one unified profile. So you can see all of your data sources and you see here, um, we have uh, the Enterprise Lake data source, we have the mobile app stream data source, um, and then on the right, you can see the different emails, right? So I have the a different email on my, uh, I believe this is the mobile app, then also uh, a different email as well. So our, you can see those two emails that are mapped correctly to this unified individual. And then also similarly, uh, the contact point address field. So they, if you remember through the match rules, you know, the address was matched on either exact fuzzy or exact normalized. So data cloud, and this is a way to uh, validate your unification and if the identity resolution rule set is working properly, um, you'll be able to see all this data come in through this unified profile. And then I know we're close to time, so I can quickly show the segments here. Um, so once you've validated and configured the identity resolution, you'll go into these segments. So we really want to target four audiences. We want a new customer communication. So as soon as you open an account, we want to target those folks. We want prospects. So we want to target folks that have not opened an account. We want to target our bank link targets, which are folks that have opened an account, but they have not been linked a bank account. And then we also want to target those who have link the bank account, but they haven't deposited any money towards uh, their account. So if we look quickly at, um, you'd be able to create a new one. You click new here, you choose your data space, you choose what we're segmenting on again. So that object, we're looking at unified individual. Um, so let me just show you what one would look like. 
once we've configured that. So you get your uh, bank link target. So if we edit the rules, you'll see here, this is where we're drag we're, we're segmenting on that unified individual. So once we've matched all those profiles and have that unified profile, we have, we are, we want to match and pull all of those unified profiles together that match this criteria. So you'll see the direct attributes, which are from the object that you're segmenting on. And you have all of those fields from that individual object. So we are looking again, if they, for bank link targets here, we want to see that they've opened the account, but they have not linked their bank account. So what we've done really, is really what you do is just drag and drop those fields um, and then edit uh, the operator. So it has, a, depending on the field type, it's going to give you a different uh, uh, options for operators. This is a Boolean field. So these are the options you have. Um, so you'll see here what we're looking at. Let me just delete this. We're looking at if the account with terms agreement is true. So if they have opened that account and if bank link is false or there's no value that is identifying for our data model that they have not opened a bank link. So this is our data source, our, our segment rule. Um, once you do that, you can click save and it'll recount for you. Um, it'll give you that segment population here to be able to view uh, you know, what an example data record that's getting populated into this segment, you do have to publish your segments. Um, for this use case, we have not done that. Um, so you can see in your details section, just more of the details of uh, your published schedule, right? So last time it was published, uh, a description, if it's active, you know, who was created by. And then you'll see here more of that published history. Let me show you one more um, just to quickly walk through this. So our prospects. So this is for those who have uh, not opened an account, but they've signed up for the app. So, right. So you, again, have this unified, po the unified indiv individual, which is your direct attribute. So those direct fields that from the object you're segmenting on. And then you have related attributes. So you can choose all of those related objects that we've mapped to. Um, those are your related attributes. So you can see here, right, we have those unified individual fields, but we also related uh, this, the unified contact point email. So we want to make sure that to target this is more of a drag and drop functionality. You can change to and or logic. Um, so it's really uh, a simple way to target and segment those audiences. I know we're at time. Um, happy to answer any quick questions or I can, you know, connect through LinkedIn if you have any questions. I do appreciate, uh, I know this was a lot, so I appreciate your time and thank you for joining. Um, I have a few minutes if we need to answer any questions. Yes, Michelle, uh, there are a couple of questions, uh, but firstly, thank you for the session and all the insights. So I am coming from the first question. Um, a Salesforce org data source account object could be mapped as an individual DMO and be individualized or there is any other DMO object. What is the best approach? Right. That's a great question. So the account object, if you are using a B2B business model, so, you know, those are, you know, actual organizations, companies, there is an account DMO. Um, if you're using person accounts, that's where you can consider, you know, mapping to that individual object. There's also an account contact DMO that you can map to. So you just really have to uh, distinguish if you have the B2B account to accounts or if, if your account object, which you know could be a person account, is an actual individual, an actual person. And the next question is the... How party identification can help in unification? Yeah, so good Milton question. Has, so party. Yeah, okay. I see Milton has already answered that. Um, so okay. I'll move on to the next one. And there is one question related to the connected profile. Um, so that is already being discussed in the previous sessions. Michelle, if you want to just go over, uh, give a high level overview of that, overview of that, please feel free to add some information on that. Okay. Yeah, so the connected profile is, yeah, so the connected profile, um, it's what's linking those, all those individual records together. So it's doing that connection and having that one profile for that connected profile. 
Um, yeah, I, I do recommend there's a lot of Salesforce documentation on there and it's been uh, the other data cloud sessions do go deep into those details. Um, I know all these terminologies could be a bit confusing at times, but really that connected profile is what's linking all of those individual records. So you can have a, you know, five different Michelles in getting those connected together. And the next one, please confirm individual is person account or custom object. Person account. So for a person account, you can map to the individual object. Again, you do have to take in consideration your data model specifically. So, you know, this could be, you know, more complex or vary depending on your data model and how you're using, you know, what your data is coming in. But a person account represents an individual. So you can map it to that individual DMO. Thank you. And how to map person account? Which DMOs should be mapped in case of person account? Yeah, the person account, uh, so you could map that to the, again, it does vary depending on your data model, but, you know, generally you can map to that individual DMO. You can use the contact point D, uh, DMO, so the contact point email, the contact point address. Um, there's also, again, there's also an account contact object. Um, so it, it does really depend on your data model and your specific use cases, but a person account, like I said, does represent an individual. So you can, and I would recommend mapping it to the individual DMO at least, and also those contact point attribute uh, objects. Awesome, I think those are all the questions. Uh, so anyone, if you have any other questions, please post them on the Slack channel. So thanks for the wonderful session and thanks everyone for joining this session. We will be sharing the recording on the Slack Tech Shop. And for the slide deck, I will, I, oh, just one more point to add, Fisher. So the slide deck link will be added to the description of the video. So once you see the video, the slide deck also will be added in there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.